Hi folks, good morning. We're gonna get started. My name is Ranger Powell, Allison Powell, and I work at James A. Garfield National Historic Site and Mentor. I brought some pieces of literature for you. This is our Unigrid, and if anyone goes to national parks, you'll recognize the blue or the black band with the arrowhead. This is a treasured piece at national parks. Everybody wants a Unigrid. This is about our site. So if you'd like to know more about James A. Garfield, feel free to read through this. We also have a new organization we are a part of, it's not our organization, called the Garfield Trail. It seeks to educate people about the four different sites that are in Northeast Ohio related to James Garfield. So our house, the log cabin he was born in in Moreland Hills, the house he lived in in Hiram College, which is now part of the campus, and of course the monument at Lakeview Cemetery. And if anyone is interested, we also love volunteers. In fact, this week, starting the 14th, which I'm not sure what the date is today, but um, it's National Volunteer Week. We have volunteers working at our front desk, giving tours, helping with special events, raking leaves. I heard maybe some of you talk about your outdoor yard work. So if you'd like to do yard work at a presidential home, we'd love, we would love to have you. So James Garfield was alive during the period known as the Victorian era, which is when Queen Victoria reigned, I believe it was 1839, and she was on the throne for 50 years. So I'm sorry, I can't do the math right now, but her reign in Britain kind of influenced the way that Americans did things, everything from clothing to etiquette, mannerisms, and even down to food. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how Americans and people in England would have eaten what they would have eaten and we'll focus a little bit on a couple of special events in James Garfield's life and what he ate during those times. So I have kind of like a fun brain activity for us today. These are some popular items and I wonder in your mind if you can split them between a hundred years ago and then a hundred years since. So things that you think maybe were popular in the 19th century and then things that were invented in the 20th century. And I'll give you just a minute to look, look through them. When I was uh, putting this together, the only one I knew for sure was um, Tang because I grew up in the 70s and I know that Tang was like orange juice to the astronauts or something like that. but. The rest of them, I, I really had no idea. So here's how we kind of split them out. You may be surprised by some of these. Cream cheese, I had no idea, was a thought in the 1800s. I knew Dr. Pepper and Coke and sort of those soft drinks were used for medicinal purposes originally, and then they added a little sugar and all of a sudden it's a, it's a trend. Cheerios in 1941, that seems kind of like recent, I would think Cheerios would have been something from long ago. All right, well, um, the things obviously in the left-hand column, a few of them would have been around when James Garfield was alive. He died in 1881, so his lifetime knew everything up until Heinz Ketchup. The Industrial Revolution brought many changes to, to people's daily lives, including changes in what people ate, when people ate and how they preserved and prepared food. The Victorian era is kind of a transitional period in food history from the past to modern times. New methods of transportation made food more available to more people and brought it to them faster. Technology improved. Until the 19th century, kitchens changed very little. The open fire with its brick oven was the only cooking system available since the Middle Ages. But in prosperous Victorian houses, the demand for excellent baked goods and puddings led to more efficient cast iron ovens. Early versions of gas ovens were exhibited at the Great Exposition of 1851, but they didn't catch on until the 1890s as people saw them as health risks and were afraid of explosions. By the 1890s, the first electric cookers had also been developed. And I have been hearing on um, NPR lately some snippets about some government agency wanting to outlaw gas stoves because of the fumes that they emit. I, for one, will fight that because I love a gas stove over an electric, uh, electric stove, but we'll see what happens. A whole range of kitchen gadgets also became available, making cooking more efficient. 
There were numerous patents for the mechanical egg beater in the latter part of the century. Foods became commercialized. Here we have that, the advent of Jell-O, originally a powder to make ice cream. From the 1860s, tinned meat was available. In the late 19th century, there was a range of available tinned food. It increased as canners competed with each other, using novel things to stuff their cans with, highly decorated printed labels, and lower prices. With the rise of the middle class and the nouveau riche came an increased interest in the proper way of managing the household and preparing food. The printing press made cookbooks and other domestic advice books readily available. And I just want to make an aside here. Servants were imperative to the functioning of middle and upper class households in the Victorian era. Even with the new advances in technology, much of the household work was done manually. To accommodate the new urban nine to five work schedule, Victorians ate dinner late and added a light meal in the afternoon. The afternoon tea was invented to stave off hunger until the late dinner hour, and we're talking about eight o'clock at night. The breakfast meal was also important to Victorians. This image shows a, a typical breakfast of brawn, which is head cheese, otherwise known as meat jelly made with flesh from the head of a calf or pig suspended in aspic. I hope you all ate your breakfast a couple hours ago. Mustard cress and radishes, bread and butter, oysters and bacon, kidneys, rolls and butter, and poached eggs. Lunch was cold chicken, boiled potatoes, scalloped veal, salad, curried eggs, bread and butter, veal cutlets, and cold ham. Even the simplest of middle-class breakfasts consisted of bacon, eggs, ham, haddock, toast, coffee, and fruits. Bread, potatoes, drippings, and cups of tea were the main foods of the poor. Wealthier families had more choice, but didn't necessarily always eat healthier. Their diet usually consisted of rich foods, meats, and sweets, as we saw in the menu in the slide before. Farming families often had the best diets because they ate a lot of fruits and vegetables. But let's start with the well-to-do. Men of the house were at the office for most of the day. Ladies were tightly corseted and expected to be decorative and demure, though they were also supposed to run households like small armies. Consider these pieces of advice from women of the day. Let her not listen to that mental ignis fatis, women's rights, but keep her head and heart clear from all that may cause her to lose sight of her true destiny and be content to be the keystone in that beautiful temple of liberty designed and executed by those noble spirits who risked all in its erection. To women is entrusted the training of the heart and the head of those who are to guard this model fabric. And this from an author of A Household Guide. I have always thought that there is no more fruitful source of family discontent than the housewife's badly cooked dinners and untidy ways. Men are now so well served out of doors at their clubs, well-ordered taverns and dining houses that in order to compete with the attractions of these places, a mistress must be thoroughly acquainted with the theory and practice of cookery as well as be perfectly conversant with all the other arts of making and keeping a comfortable home. That's a lot of responsibility, isn't it? To aid the mistress in keeping house, a typical upper middle class family had six servants, including a cook, a butler, and a lady's maid. Dinner parties were show with showy food, preferably prepared by your own French chef, were the way to entertain and display wealth for these newly rich middle classes. Informing the menus of these elaborate parties was Charles Elmi Francatelli, one of the most famous culinary celebrities of his time. Think of Emeril Lagasse of the Victorian era. Francatelli was an Englishman of Italian descent who traveled to France to study the art of French haute cuisine or high cuisine. 
Revered for his blending of the best Italian and French cuisines, Francatelli was regarded as a leading chef in Victorian London and spent most of his career in Britain directing the kitchens of several aristocrats and noblemen. In 1861, Francatelli published The Cook's Guide and Housekeepers and Butler's Assistant, which became a book of reference for any well-managed household. It was described as a practical treaty on English and foreign cookery. In addition to well over a thousand recipes of the day, the guide contained instructions for the service of wine, directions for preparing diets for invalids, Epicurean salads, medicinal drinks, and American drinks and beverages. Francatelli's research uncovered fancy molds that became a staple in the kitchens of the well-to-do. Pudding, ice cream, and jellies in the 19th century were symbols of sophistication and status. Butter molds were also common. Francatelli also preached that the plating of food was an artistic endeavor as well. Victorians never missed a detail. The arrangement of the food as well as the garnishes and the vessels carrying the food had to be beautiful. Color was also considered when choosing the appropriate combinations. Oyster patties, whiting, trout, white bait, mackerel, salmon paste, lobster, and crab are all pictured here in suites of pink. We have a brown slide consisting of things like turkey, duck, pigeon and fowl, more seafood, vegetables. I'd love to know how they got those green beans and the Brussels sprouts to stay, stay mounded so perfectly so nothing comes off the plate. Fruits, very colorfully decorated, and of course, desserts. Francatelli once remarked that he could feed every day a thousand families on the food that was wasted in London. To this end, he issued a plain cookery book for the working classes, which contained information of practical value to the working classes. This included economical delights such as cow heel broth, bubble and squeak, sheep's pluck, and a pudding made of small birds. Cabbage, uh, and I had to look this up because I had heard of bubble and squeak, but I didn't know what it was. It's cabbage and potatoes fried together. So that doesn't sound so bad. Economy and convenience was stressed for the working class because again, they didn't have the money to go out and buy a lot of fancy ingredients. So here are some dishes that were easy to make and economical. Hash, hash was a dish consisting of diced meats potatoes and spices that are mixed together and then cooked either alone or with other ingredients. Stews and soups consisted of any food and food scraps on hand, thrown into a pot and boiled. Typically these were fish, game, meat, vegetables, and root vegetables. Pigeon was marketed as cheap food for slaves and for the poor because at one time pigeons were extremely populous in the United States and in England and also onions, potatoes, broccoli, cabbage, and apples, among the cheapest and most commonly available foods. On average, working class Victorians ate a lot more than we do today. Many people were laborers and farmers and needed extra calories. Men sometimes walked miles to work. Factory workers and domestic chores were demanding and kept one on his or her feet most of the day. Men typically consumed about 5,000 calories a day and women about 3,000, and that's about double what our calorie consumption should be today. I'll excerpt the Sunday meal that's here from, uh, from 1895. Boiled turbot and oyster sauce with potatoes, a roast leg or gherskin, which is the lean part of a pork loin, applesauce, broccoli, potatoes, Cabinet pudding and damson tart made with preserved damsons. Damsons are a small tart fruit from the Asian plum tree. That's just dinner. Another Victorian culinary contributor was Isabella Beaton. Mrs. B, as she was called, was educated in Germany and met the publisher Samuel Beaton and they married. Her book of Household Management, published in 1861, encompassed fashion, childcare, 
animal husbandry, medicine, science, religion, and law, as well as food. This book was compiled by the Beatons from earlier sources. Mrs. Beaton had some comments about hash, making hash from leftovers. She said, there is nothing worse for health or for the palate than a poor hash. While a good hash is not only a favorite dish of most families, but an essential article of economy and convenience. For this reason, a separate article is devoted to this subject. The following are the ways in which hashes are spoiled. The first is by cooking them. Meat, when once cooked, should only be heated. If it is again stewed or fried, it tends to make it hard and tough and diminishes its flavor. The second is by frying the butter, or is by frying it in butter or gravy. It has been shown that this is very injurious to the healthfulness of the food. Butter and oils may be melted without changing their nature, but when cooked, they become much more indigestible and injurious to weak stomachs. The third most injuring hashes is by putting flour in such ways that it is not properly cooked. Flour dredged onto hashes while they are cooking generally imparts the raw taste of dough. Did you know there were so many wrong ways to cook hash? Back in America, specifically in rural Ohio, people couldn't be quite as picky about their hashes. James A. Garfield, who grew up in a log cabin in the wilderness of Ohio, enjoyed blood stew and squirrel stew as a boy. Store-bought goods like sugar and coffee were out of the question for this poor family. Food wasn't always a friend to James Garfield. In the Army during the Civil War, many soldiers suffered from dysentery, diarrhea, and nausea due to poor sanitation, lack of medicine, and a terrible diet of hardtack and coffee. By the end of his service in the war, he had taken to calling it my old malady. It is unsurprising that a veteran of the Civil War would have a continued interest in digestive medicine. Garfield personally owned a copy of this book, Our Digestion or My Jolly Friend's Secret, written by Diocletian Lewis in 1870. And this is actually the book we have in the Garfield home. This guide to digestion explores in sometimes graphic detail how food is consumed, processed and digested by the human body, with a focus on keeping one's teeth clean. Garfield and his Victorian contemporaries had good reason to be concerned with their digestive health. Death attributed to malnutrition, intestinal parasites, and other food and stomach-related illnesses were extremely common at this time. Lucretia Garfield, the president's wife, was overwhelmed with the drudgery and daily grind of baking bread until she decided to make the most out of her inevitable chore. She would get over this dislike by taking a special interest in the task. She wrote to her husband, the very sunshine seemed flowing down to my spirit into the white loaves, and now I believe my table is furnished with better bread than ever before. I feel that now I need not be the shrinking slave of toil, but its regal master. So that seems to work, work for her, mind over matter. No doubt Farmer Garfield, it, he, his farm and mentor was about 160 acres, enjoyed a wide variety of healthy foods during the summer when he took up residence at his mentor farm. Uh, he did spend most of the year in Washington, D.C., where he was a congressman, but when Congress was in recess, he would come home to his mentor farm. On election night, November 2nd of 1880, James Garfield celebrated his presidential victory with family and friends at his home in Mentor. They had a celebration dinner at midnight. It consisted of ham and champagne, duck and oysters. And these next slides show the dining room of the Garfield home. I'll just point out a couple special features because it is a beautiful room. The stained glass door was added many years later by Mrs. Garfield, so that eastern wall would have been just two windows. But this features some artwork done by the family. If you look real close surrounding the fireplace, you'll see small squares with decorations. Those tiles were painted by Mrs. Garfield and her children. The two in the upper corners were done by Lucretia, and the children created some of the other tiles. 
We also have the top row of plates here, which was taken from their family, China, the Haviland Limoges China. Mrs. Garfield painted them with flowers and ferns. Um, this was considered their presidential China because it was used in the White House. Garfield was assassinated about six months after obtaining office, so he didn't have enough time to do a lot of the sort of the housekeeping things like ordering presidential China. And then it was brought back to the Garfield home and used um, by the family again. But from this point of view, you can also see the dining room table with the celebration meal set on it. Don't worry, everything's fake. But we have ham and champagne, canvasback duck, and oysters. And what I always like to think about is, you know, the ham, the duck, they were probably walking around in another form back in Garfield's time uh, on the farm. But the oysters probably took a little bit of logistics. They couldn't just go to, you know, Euclid Fish and buy a couple couple dozen oysters for their celebration. That would have that would have taken some pre-planning. So I'd like to think that yes, James Garfield won the Civil War, uh, won the presidency. So this was a celebration meal, but if he didn't win, they still would be having ham, champagne, duck and oysters. At Garfield's inaugural ball in the Smithsonian Castle on March 4th of 1881, 7,000 attendees ate and ate. They had over 100 gallons of oysters, 1,500 pounds of turkey, 50 hams, 200 gallons of chicken salad, 700 loaves of bread, 2,000 biscuits, 1,000 rolls, 15,000 cakes, and by cakes I'm assuming these are small cakes, um, 150 gallons of ice cream, 50 gallons of ices, and 250 gallons of coffee. Quite a different meal was served to the president starting in July of 1881. After bedridden from an assassin's bullet in his back, First Lady Lucretia Garfield often went down to the White House kitchen herself to prepare nourishing dishes for her sick husband. The president preferred simple dishes over rich European dishes. Well, we'll end on a happy note by recalling a wedding feast at the Garfield home about 100, let's see, the date I wrote this was 141 years ago, so let's say 146 years ago. On June 14th, 1888, a presidential wedding of sorts took place in the Presidential Memorial Library here. It was the wedding of James Garfield's only daughter, Molly, to Garfield's secretary, Joseph Stanley Brown. And it was actually a double wedding ceremony because one of his sons, Harry also ma got married in the presidential library at the same time. They had a double wedding ceremony. There were about 120 people in the library for the ceremony. And if you've ever been to the Garfield site, um, I still can't believe how many, how that many people fit in that small space. It, it is a large space, but when you're talking about 150 or 120 people, it seems very small. So after the ceremony, there was a reception for 50. And I always wonder, like, how did they? let the other people know that they weren't invited to re the reception because they had to walk right through it to get out of the library. Anyway, uh, guests were seated at beautifully adorned tables that had flowers and lights where they enjoyed a meal of bullion, supreme of sweetbreads, and I'm not talking pastry here when I say sweetbreads, Italian salad, personal ice cream, coffee, and two wedding cakes, one for each couple. And this is an image of a 50th anniversary invitation that was drawn by, I think, Harry Garfield. So he drew this picture, his remembrance of what the bay window in the library looked like during the ceremony. And this is what he used for the 50th anniversary party invitation that went out to his guests. So that's a quick culinary trip of Victorian America, and I hope you have some new perspectives on the food that we consume today, and maybe think twice about some of the, the ones that we think might be new but are old, based on that first list I showed you, things that were created 100 years ago or earlier, and those that are in our more modern times. So that's all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, you're welcome.